All right, everyone. So it is 10.05 um, and I'm gonna kick things off and get going. So if anyone else jumps in, um, we can play some catch up if, if needed. But I'm really excited to kick off this webinar with you and uh, share a lot about ApeBase and hopefully how it is relevant and useful to the things that you guys are working on, whether it's a personal projects or within software development companies um, or agencies, right? So this is gonna be a recorded session. So we're gonna record the entire webinar and host it on uh, YouTube so that people can reference it later. Uh, however, the format of it, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna kick it off with an introduction on 8Base. Uh, we're gonna dive straight into the product and go through a demo of the product that's gonna be guided by as if we were building out some type of CMS application. Uh, go then from the console experience to the IDE or the a little bit more on the developer experience. And then after that, open it up to questions. And we can talk about anything that we saw in the demo, anything that you guys are working on, or any questions in general that you have about 8Base or development, whatever you want to talk about. All right. But um, let's get going. So I am going to share my screen. And one second, share a screen. And I think that if you guys can see a mountain in the ocean, that's my screen and I think we are good at this point. All right. One second, let me see if I can pull up the chat. There we go. And we can see it. Perfect. Thank you all. Okay, so let's start over here. All right. So first off, what is 8Base as quickly as possible? So 8Base is a backend as a service currently. That's our platform product, right? So if you're familiar with what Firebase is at Google or what Parse was back in the day, uh, the 8Base product or the 8Base backend is very analogous to that. However, we approach it with a completely different technology stack for a completely different purpose. Um, a lot of the backend as a services over the years have been designed to how can I really quickly set up a, like a scrappy mobile app or just do a backend that I can just have done and not have to really worry about. Um, the 8Base backend has been built so that you can build highly scalable digital products, right? So the idea of with other backends saying that, oh, we're gonna set this up and then you know we know we're gonna have to do a rewrite in a year, but that'll be fine. That's not what you're dealing with when, when you're dealing with an 8Base. Essentially, you're saying, hey, I'm choosing 8Base as a backend technology. I'm adopting this great architecture that we will talk more about. Um, and then that will grow with me and my company, right? So I have this great productivity tool that's going to cut down a lot of my timeline, a lot of my costs from both a talent standpoint as well as just a timeline standpoint and, um, and have a wonderful developer experience uh, in the meantime. So if you go to 8Base.com, there's a lot you can read about it. And the product is apbase.com, right? So there's no installing software. This is a managed service. You don't have to create a Google Cloud or an AWS account and figure out how to install it there. You go to apbase, you click login, you create an account and you get going. So when you log in, you're gonna be at your developer home, right? This is what we call developer home, right? And essentially this is my console to where I have access to all the different projects that I'm working on. So being a power user of apbase, uh, I have all the projects that have been shared with me and I'm collaborating on. So those are projects owned by other people that I've been invited to. Um, if I'm not belonging to any organizations at the moment, but if I had an organization, I could jump into any of those organizations and see what organization workspaces I have access to, um, as well as in the ones that are, of course, my workspaces that are right here. Now, what exactly is a workspace, right? So whenever you create a workspace on a base, you can essentially think of that as a project, right? So that project, when you create it, is going to spin up on AWS a three-tier serverless architecture. So it's going to put a unique API endpoint at API Gateway. It's going to initialize AWS Lambda for you, which is where our A-Base GraphQL API is going to mount onto. And then it's going to spin up a brand new instance of an Aurora MySQL database for your database. And around that, there's a lot of you know, peripheral um, components that, that pop in. You know, things like roles and permissions, authentication, file storage, but that's the core skeleton that you're gonna be able to adopt. So if we wanted to do that, we can go here, click create new workspace. I'm gonna say this is webinar workspace and we want this in Northern Virginia. And I'm gonna put on the eight base plan because I get access to that. And I'm gonna go ahead and create it. So 
this is going ahead and doing that entire scaffolding for us, right? And so you can think of it almost as like a, uh, oh my God, what's the name of that? The CloudFront, ah, I forgot the name of it for a minute, but nonetheless. So it went ahead, created the new database, created all those resources for us. And now the page will reload. And once it drops us back into our developer home, wait a second, we have our new webinar workspace. So I click into here. It's gonna drop me into the workspace dashboard, right? So this is a basic dashboard. All the different plans that you have for your workspaces have different quotas on them. So for example, I get 100 million um, GraphQL subscription requests per month, 10 million function invocations, so on and so forth. Um, as well as here's my API endpoint, right? So if I'm building any type of front end, whether that's a, a JavaScript app like React or Vue.js, whether I'm using a low code front end builder like Retool, this is the endpoint that I can use to get data in and out of my backend or the endpoint I can use to get data in and out of my backend. However, in a base, really the core of the projects, even though we have a lot of use cases where people are using it for maybe just the serverless runtime, um, we look at the core of ApeBase being the data builder, right? Or the data model that you're putting into ApeBase. And I'll show you why um, as we go through this, this example. So if we go here to the data, right? Here we have no tables in our database. And as I said earlier, ApeBase, the data layer in ApeBase is in Aurora MySQL database hosted on AWS. So we have created this tool that will allow you to really conveniently and intuitively um, not only add tables to your database, but add fields to those tables and then build relationships between the tables. So for example, let's say I wanted to have a table in my CMS called posts and every post had a title, which was a text field, which was mandatory. I could create that field and then also, a post has a body, which is also a text field. However, we want to have up to 10,000 characters. The input is a markdown input, so we can author markdown documents for our blog posts. That's also mandatory. Create that field. And then let's just say that for our posts, we also want them to have cover images, right? So I could say cover image, go here, click on file say it's an image type, create that field. And already via our API just with that, we can upload images, they get stored in S3, we can query um, links, download links for them to display them in our front ends, um, as well as tweak some settings on there if we wanted them to expire at a certain time or whatnot. Now, as if you look here, when we are creating these fields, we have a lot of different field types, right? So text fields, number fields, date fields, switches, which are essentially Boolean fields or enumerations or enums, um, files, tables, which is the relationships, smart fields, which are essentially JSON objects with some validation on top of them. JSON, if you wanna store arbitrary JSON blobs, um, as well as geo fields, which are super cool because essentially you're able to store geo JSON in the database. And then at the API level, it's already all set up so you can do location-based querying, you know, find, um, do radius calculations. So, hey, I want to see every restaurant within three miles of this point that you're sending in. Um, so all the geo uh, logic is built in. Now, what's also great is, so for example, 8Base is already managing the users table for you, which is super helpful because we know most apps needs users. Um, and so, for example, if you look at the users table, it already has email, status, origin, first name, last name, time zone, avatar, the roles that belong to that user. All those things are already baked in for you. Um, however, you can add new fields to your users table however you want to. But what's important to show is that now we want a relationship between our post tables and our users table. So all I have to do is grab my users table, come out here and drop it over. And then here on the right side, I can actually configure what type of relationship that is. So it just defaulted to a user has many posts, which makes a lot of sense. We'll probably keep that one. However, if I wanted to, I could say it's a many to many to relationship, a one to many in either direction, a one to one, or like a has one relationship or a belongs to relationship if I wanna make that mandatory between the two. Now, hopefully you're seeing where this can go, right? And so we have customers or clients that have workspaces with one table in them 
right? There's throwing some data in there. Maybe it's like a web scraper that they're just putting the data they need into one table. Um, we have clients and customers that have several hundred tables in their workspaces, really complex data models, all built in here. Um, this tool really will stretch that far as for as complex of a use case as you need to accommodate. Um, and also the really important thing just to highlight here is that as we're going through and making these changes, ApeBase is not just shoving this data into some virtual spreadsheet. Uh, it's actually auto-generating all the database migrations that need to be run and then running them against the production database. So it's a true DB admin solution rather than just a unstructured data tool, right? So hopefully that provides some helpful context. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into another workspace that I built out a little bit farther so we wouldn't have to spend too much time doing the same thing of going and building out a data model. Um, however, all the steps that we just covered is all it really took to get to where this next workspace is going to be. So if I go into my developer home and I go to my CMS demo workspace, this one's going to load up. And I'm going to go to my data model. And here we can see that I have posts, publications, comments, as well as my users table, right? So still pretty simple. So let's just think of that. We took that time, we built these extra ones out. And as you can see, there's just a couple of different, a couple of extra fields on each of these tables. Now, 8Base in the console provides you a nice experience if you want to, of just looking at this kind of data viewer tool to say, hey, you know, if I wanted to, I could jump in and edit one of my articles right here. One second, while that loads. Here, let's edit it in the full view. There we go. Oh, yikes. So if we wanted to, you know, we could go and edit this, uh, this document right here, change the picture. This is a published one. The author is this James person, and then it has some comments on it. And it's part of the food publication. So if we think of our data domain here, we have publications, publications have many posts and those comment, there's comments on those posts and every post belongs to an author, right? However, what's really important about to understand about ABASE, and this is where it becomes a tremendous time-saving tool on any project that you're using it for, is that while we were going through and actually building out this data model, ABASE was auto-generating a GraphQL API for us in real time. So that means that as soon as we say, hey, we, we're done with our data model, or we're halfway, but we want to start building some stuff, we already have a ready-to-use GraphQL API from which we can start querying and sending data to and from. Um, this means that you know if you come from a Node.js Express background, if you come from a Ruby on Rails background, a Django background, any of the popular frameworks, you're not having to write any controllers, any serializers, any, any of that, right? It's all done for you. So let's actually look at what that looks like. If we go to this area here called the API Explorer, what's super cool about this is this is essentially the exact same syntax that we get to write in any of our front end applications. So even though this is in the console, it's essentially an API client. So if you were using Postman or Graphical, or like I said, writing the same syntax in a React app or a Vue.js app, you'd be having the exact same experience that we're gonna have right here, right? So let's say that we want to build out a homepage for our website, right? Our, C, our, um, our publication site, right? So we have our data model, it has some publications, some posts, all these, all these um, different data in these tables. And now we want to make a home screen that has our publications and we wanna know how many posts is in each publication, right? So 8Base has already built out for us the publications list query. So if I say I want a list of publications and for each publication, which are the items, I want to know the name of the publication. I want the cover image because I'm going to display that. So I'm going to go into that cover image and say, what's its download URL? And then I want to know how many posts the publication has. So I want to count of all its posts, right? I write out this query, which is a pretty semantically accurate query. I can run it and that's the data we're getting back, right? So we're seeing that, hey, we have a nature publication, we have a food publication. It has this URL for the image, which I could display on my front end. And then this one has two posts, this one has one post, right? 
Now, what's really cool about GraphQL for those who aren't too familiar with it is that it's a dynamic, um, it's, a di it's a dynamic uh, API language, right? So essentially, if I was using a traditional REST endpoint, right, I'd be saying, hey, get me the slash publications or hit call the slash publications endpoint and return me any data that it wants to. And I'd be getting this massive object or massive list of objects that show me all the, all the data for publications. However, in GraphQL, I can essentially say this is all that I want and only send me back that. So for example, if we wanted to update this query to where we actually didn't care about the post count, right? And instead we wanted to just know, hey, when was this um, publication created? Change that and I rerun the query and boom, that's exactly what I'm getting back in JSON format through my data API, right? Now, what's also really important is that these, these uh, queries are relational, right? So I'm also not having to go to different endpoints to get different types of data. As long as they have a relation between them, I can go through that relation with my query and extract back the data that I wanted. So for example, let's drop the cover image because it takes up a lot of the screen for the sake of this example. And let's say I want the name when it's created at, and then for the posts, I want for every post belonging to each publication, I want the title of the post and the status of the post. So I now run that. And cool, that's what I'm getting. I can see that in the nature publication, I have five best vacation spots on earth and then the secret life of lobsters. And then for food, I have 12 tacos you need to try in Oaxaca, right? So really, really dynamic and powerful um, uh, GraphQL tool, way, way to query your data and get it back out of the back end. Um, now, what's really great about this as well is that inside the API here, it already has pre-built in a lot of the advanced API operations that a lot of teams take a long time to build and figure out their own implementation too. For example, things like pagination, grouping and aggregation, sorting, um, filtering, search. A good example is let's say that we wanted to add a filter and this we could be sent in through a search input or you get pre-selected options to where for our publications, we only wanted publications where the name of the publication contained the string nat, right? So if I rerun that, now only the nature of publication is gonna come back, okay? And what's important about these filters, which is really powerful, is that they are all, um, they are all determined by the field type. And so all the predicates are appropriate for the field type. So this was a string or a text field so if I look here, I can see if the string I supplied equals, doesn't equal, is in, not in, contains, starts with, not starts with, all these different things. And for the GeoJSON, for the date logic, all those things, it all trickles down, right? So really, really powerful tool in that way. Now, if we go over here, once again, if you're familiar with GraphQL, this might be a little bit, um, the, you'll be familiar with this, but for those who not, it's a really cool thing. Uh, GraphQL is a self-documenting specification, right? So over here, when we have the documentation explorer, we can look in here and see that, okay, um, if I wanna see what type of write operations does my publication have, I can see that eight bases already generated, my ability to create them, create many at one time, delete, delete by filters, destroy or destroy by filters, restore update or update by filters, all these different resources. So a lot of options I have there for how I want to manipulate my data. And then finally, What's really cool is it also auto generates the subscriptions for you. Uh, subscriptions are WebSocket connections. So if you are building messaging apps, if you're building real time notification feeds, that's your ability to say, hey, whenever an event happens on the database, a record's created, updated, or deleted, uh, I want a real time notification or a real time update event sent back to the client that's subscribed to that so that they didn't have to do a page refresh to get the uh, data that I'm looking for. Um, We've built messaging apps, notification feeds, um, stock tickers, all these different things using that feature and it works really, really well, right? So great thing to have for when you're going and building a project. Now, how are we doing? Great. So one thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna add a little bit to our data model just to make it, uh, just to go through that, right? And so what we wanna do here is that we wanna actually add the ability of creating subscriptions to our publications, right? How do we do that? So first off, what we'll do is we will create a new table 
called subscriptions. Now, the one thing that I want to note here, um, there are bounds. So let's say publication subscriptions. So the one thing that we're doing here is this is just an idea of how you could do that, right? You have the flexibility with a tool like Gatebase and implementing things however you want, right? But it's a very intuitive way of going and actually implementing whatever you have in mind. So we have our new table called subscriptions, which we're going to give it a one called a uh, plan. And so we'll go to the switch and say that we're having a custom one, which is going to be free, paid, and let's say frozen. Maybe someone forgets to pay and you implement a way of marking that as frozen. It's going to be a mandatory field and they'll always default to free when you create a new subscription. Cool. We'll add that. Then what we're also going to do is let's say that they get a free trial of like 30 days, right? So we're going to add a trial expiration date, which is going to be a date time. And it's going to be not mandatory yet. Yeah, let's say it's mandatory. Cool. Or no, we'll leave it not mandatory and create that field. Cool. And then we will also now build the relationship between the two tables, which the subscription will be relevant to. So we're going to say a subscription belongs to a user, which we're going to call members. So a member and a member, let's say that a member can have many or, or just one, one subscription. And that is mandatory and that is mandatory, both relationships. Cool. Oh, for system table. Oh, that's weird. Oh, got it. Stay. Put there. And here, let's just create that there like that. Cool. And then we are also going to add the uh, publication. Cool. And same thing, a publication can have many subscriptions. So that is relevant that way. Create that field and we are good. Okay, so why do we do this? What we saw in the beginning was how to create a data model, right? So what's my data structure? Then we played around with the API a little bit to see, hey, how can I actually get data in and out of my API? And we were able to do that super fast. Now, what's really important is saying, okay, well, I can create my data structure, I can get data in and out, but how do I make sure that only the right types of user is being able to interact with the tables they should or shouldn't, right? So what we now get to check out is the concept of roles and permissions in Apebase, which is a super powerful feature. It's how for our customers, we build full multi-tenant systems or our customers for themselves are building really complex apps with full level security. So here, what we have is roles, right? And a role is essentially just a name to which we will associate many permissions. So we already have the author role here, which I added a little bit earlier, right? And so if we look in the author role, we can see that for an author, and that's any user that has been assigned the author role, it's a relationship between two tables or a rec two records and two tables. Um, we at the table level can specify for each type of operation or even the field level, what they can and cannot do when hitting the API. So for example, we're saying that, hey, if you're an author, you can create comments, you can read all the comments on any record. However, you can only update the comments that you created, and then you can only delete the comments that you created, right? And if we wanted to, we could jump into field level access here and say that you can only read when the comment was created. You can only read when the last updated at, or when the comment was last updated, you can't manually um, coerce the updated timestamp, but then you can see the body and we don't want you to ever see whether or not the post was flagged, right? We save that and now suddenly the API will always obey those rules. Now, if we look here at the posts, this might be a little bit more interesting. So as an author, you can create posts, makes sense. However, which posts can you read? We have this thing called custom filter. Now, what's really cool about this is this is allowing us to essentially specify a filter that whenever someone's hitting the API, it's always applied to the query. So that means that as the front end developer or as the business um, owner, you never have to worry about your front end developer not specifying some type of filter and actually exposing data to the 
to your users that they should never see, right? So essentially for us here, we're saying that, hey, an author, anyone that has the author role can read a post if they either created it or the status equals published. So they would never see any other author's draft posts. That would not be possible, right? So we can go ahead and exit out of that because that was saved. And then we're allowing them to update their own records, delete their own records, so on and so forth, right? So let's hop back here and quickly create a member role. So now we're gonna have a role for our members. Add that role. We're gonna go in here, click on the role and now we can go through. Now we could take a minute to turn all these off, but for the sake of just going through it, let's do the relevant ones. So what we wanna do is we wanna say, hey, which publication? So first off, they can't create a publication, right? Now they should be able to read all publications because we want them to see the ones that they might wanna to subscribe to, right? However, we don't want them to be able to read the posts. Even if the developer accidentally set a query that says, hey, send me back all the posts. If they're logged in, we don't want the member to see it unless they have a, a uh, subscription. So what we're gonna do is they're not an author, so they also can't create the posts. We are going to jump into here and say, hey, we want a custom filter, right? And so the post, if it has a, uh, if it belongs to a publication where the publication subscription, if, one second, let's see, if one of the users or if any of the publication subscriptions belongs to a member that is self, that means that then there is a publication subscription that connects the two and therefore they can read the posts, right? So if that's a little bit confusing, don't worry about it. It works great. And we have a lot of really good documentation online and videos that explain how to use these things um, to, for building really, really complex use cases, right? Or systems. So I go ahead and save that. And now that custom filter is gonna be applied to all read operations against my post table for anyone that's logged in as a member. Um, cool. So then, you know, for example, we could go through and say, okay, well, members can comment, they can read, but hopefully at this point, we kind of get the general idea of roles and permissions. So the next thing I want to jump into is at this level, we also are able to help with authentication. So what's cool about APIS, the way we handle authentication is that we are not an authentication provider. However, we can read the JSON web tokens from any authentication provider that is OpenID compliant. So if you like to use Auth0, Okta, Cognito, uh, Microsoft Identity Server, you can use any of those and just plug it into APACE. Uh, however, we do offer an expedited option, which in the background we are using um, AWS Cognito to enable. And so for example, if I wanted to go and create a new authentication profile, um, and essentially all this is gonna do is provide us some keys that we can use when building our front end to set up authentication and build the, and make the connection. I could say this is my, default auth profile. Now, these are the different authentication types. For example, if you want to use auth0, this is all information you can easily get from your auth0 account. However, I'm going to say APS authentication, say anyone can sign up for our app. And then when they sign up for the first time, let's just say that they're added the member role, right? So I add that profile. And now after creating it, like I said, it's giving me the client ID, the, do the login domain, all the different things I need to use in my front end application so that I can quickly, um, quickly enable my login flow and have users authenticating and securely querying the API. Um, and once again, we have a lot of videos, a lot of documentation all online that will help you, um, that will help you set all these things up, whether you're, regardless of the type of application that you're building. So from there, you know, we have some, just more general platform things. We have the ability to create API tokens, right? So those are static tokens that um, don't expire and don't necessarily belong to any logged in or authenticated user that you can assign roles to so that when making um, requests to the API, it's authenticated. Now those can be used for if you're creating an authenticated CI CD flow. Um, I've used those and seen people use those in projects where they're trying to authenticate fleets of IoT devices or VR headsets. There's a lot of really great use cases for those and you can build the custom roles around those as well. Um, environment variables, which I will show you in just a minute, how those become relevant. 
And then, like I said, just more general platform stuff that if you dive into the tool and start exploring a little bit yourself, you'll be able to utilize and learn. Um, however, there's one really big important thing that we should cover before we jump into kind of questions and, and follow up, which is that this is all great, but I'm sure that you all have ideas in mind at this point on where this would apply, but being like, oh, but there's like this 10 or 20% that it doesn't cover, right? It's like, okay, well, I'm not just building a CRUD app. You know, I'm not just needing these things. I actually have some, some domain specific business logic or business use cases that how would we accommodate that using this tool? Um, this is how. So what's really great about ApeBase is that, or at least the way I like to think about it is that it covers the 80%, right? So if you have an idea for an app or if your customer has an idea for an app, most of the time, the idea is I want to see this type of interface that has this type of data displaying in it, right? The, the fact that that application needs authentication, you know, a CRUD API, roles and permissions, you know, a secure, all those pieces are kind of like, they're not IP, they're not unique to the idea. They're the non-unique parts that every idea needs um, to be enabled. That's the stuff that ApeBase wants to focus on, right? The other side, when it comes to the back end, is your ability to write custom JavaScript functions and deploy them to AWS Lambda with four different function types that we'll cover, which essentially allows you to do anything that you've ever wanted to do or can do with Node.js. Now, those will run in your back end. They'll be connected to your ApeBase back end. And we're going to go ahead and offer some of those right now to really show you that any way that you want to extend ApeBase, any third-party API you want to connect to is totally, uh, totally feasible. You can do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my code environment over here, or my IDE, VS Code. And I'm going to create a new ApeBase server-side project. So I have the ApeBase command line tool installed, which you can do by running npm install uh, global last g eight base CLI if you wanted to run that. However, I can now use it and say eight base init my so let's just say CMS uh, server side and run that. Cool. So it's going to ask me right now, which project do I want to connect to, right? So this is saying, which backend do I want, or which workspace do I want to connect to? So I'm going to scroll down to my CMS demo workspace, click enter there. Now that popped up right here. And so I'm going to open it. So it created four example functions for me. If I wanted to, there's a flag I could pass to my command line tool that would emit those, but I didn't for this sake. Um, and so it show is giving me an example of each type of function ApeBase offers currently, right? Let's go through them. The first one is a resolver function. So that essentially means that I can create a new GraphQL operation on the GraphQL API, right? That has a structured input and a structured output. And then I get to write any JavaScript that needs to execute in between. The next one is a task function. So a task function is a great way to encapsulate logic if I want to call it from other functions. So maybe I have one type of function that I want to use across many functions instead of rewriting my code multiple times. I can encapsulate that in a task and then use that when, um, when writing my functions. The other way a task can be used, which is really cool, is on a schedule. So if I wanted to here, I could say that there's a schedule that runs at a rate of one or every, let's say, three days. And if I do that and deploy that function every three days, I think around like 9 a.m. EST, something like that, uh, that function will invoke. Uh, however, this is just a simplified format that allows you, and we have documentation on which one options are there. It also supports full cron format, right? So if you want your function to run on the third Thursday of every leap year at 8.20, right? you can specify that time interval as well. It's really flexible. I'll pop that out of there. Uh, webhooks, we then have the ability to create webhooks. Essentially that is a unique path that's appended to the end of your 8Base Workspace API or your 8Base Workspace endpoint and can be called using any traditional uh, HTTP verb, right? So if you wanna create a post, get, delete, patch, put, head request um, that 
get sent over to 8 base, you can do that. Where is that useful? Let's say that you are building some type of, for our subscriptions, you are using Stripe to charge your users. You could create a, um, a web hook endpoint that Stripe calls, passing up the data whenever a transaction has failed, whenever a new user signs up, and then use that data on the base side to manipulate your data records, create a new record, do whatever that you want to do. Um, and then finally, we have triggers, which are extremely useful. Uh, this is essentially your ability to create a function that runs on a database event. So you can say, hey, either before or after any table is created, updated, or deleted, I want this function to invoke. And that function will be past the context that's relevant to that invocation, right? So certain data will come in if it's a before um, request, certain data will come in if it's after the updates happened, like both records before or after the update, um, as well as if it was a create, update, or delete. Um, and once again, in our developer docs, which is docs so the apbase.com, we have all of that information right there for you. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and write a little function. So I'm going to actually remove all these right now because we'll look into them in a minute. And we're going to say, okay, let's do a base generate a new trigger called um, add expiration date. And it's going to be, we're going to say it's an uh, JavaScript. So this supports TypeScript and JavaScript, whichever one you're more comfortable working with, you can go ahead and do it. However, it will compile down all the same and deploy to your workspace. So I'm going to add that. Oh, oh, I got to move into my project. So CMS server side. Cool. Generate the trigger. Awesome. So now if I go into the source, we have all those different folders here. I want to look at my triggers. And in here, I have my add expiration date trigger, which I then have my JavaScript uh, handler. I open that. It has some in document or encode documentation. I'm going to delete the example here. All right. And inside here, I get to write my JavaScript, right? Now, what's important is that if you're familiar, if you're a Node.js developer or a JavaScript developer, um, you have access to any NPM package that you want, right? So you can do npm install, it will add it to your package.json. So let's say that I wanted to send a text message in one of these functions. I could install the, let's say the Twilio SDK and then import the, let's just call it Twilio from Twilio and then use that module in here, right? To send an SMS, do whatever I need, make a voice call, do whatever I need to do, right? So let's just say that the module that we were using was Twilio send SMS. And then my SMS was, hey, and I was sending it to some phone number, right? I'd be able to do that here. And then the environment variables that I mentioned earlier, this is where they become relevant. I can access them in these functions. So for example, to initialize this Twilio module, I would probably have to have some type of API key, which is sensitive. Um, so I could go env, or excuse me, process, dot env and if i had set that api or that um environment variable inside my workspace i could get it let's say it was called twilio env api key could use that and then let's say that that was the right way of writing that function cool i'd be able to go about it that way however i'm going to delete these two things here and here what we're going to do is this function, we're going to say that it's going to run before a publication subscription is created, because we want to set the expiration date on that publication subscription. I have some pre written code right here, which I'm going to snag and drop into the function. So essentially, we're saying we're going to create a new date that is going to have a we're going to add 30 days to it, we're going to give them a 30 day trial. And so what I'm going to do now is jump back to my workspace, make sure that I have the right field name. Cool. Trial expiration. And so now what I get to do, oh, here we are. Now what I get to do is I get to say event dot data trial expiration date, because that's the data that 
we need a set. And I'm just going to set it equal to the JSON value. Oop, there we go. There. And now, since I'm passing that data right back in, it's going to use that now as the new input on the create operation. Um, another way that we could write this, which might be more intuitive, oh, excuse me, is go boom. And there we go. Cool. All right. So there's a lot of different ways that we can deploy, right? So for example, if you were in a more production application, 8Base has built in CI CD. So let's say that we had a master branch or a master environment, a staging environment, then a development environment, and we wanted to actually move those migrations all the way through that. Um, we would deploy it to the development environment and then go through that migration process to get out to production. Personally, what I like to do is I like to set up a GitHub repo where I push my code to. It performs static syntax checks, all that type of stuff. And then if all those pass, it deploys it to my um, to my workspace using an action script. However, here, we can just show how easy, if you want it to be, you could deploy these changes. Um, you would just be able to run 8Base deploy, run that. And it's going to handle the complete packaging and deployment of all these functions to your um, to your service runtime for your workspace, right? It usually takes about a minute or two, right? So the one thing that I will mention while we wait is that how do you test these functions? So if we want to, there's two ways we can test them from the command line. Once we've deployed them, you can test the production response. However, the other way is you get to write mocks for them. So for example, here we have a request mock, which is essentially saying, this is the argument that's gonna be passed into my function, right? And we can write multiple of these. So if we wanted one that's like, hey, we want to mock a successful response, uh, unsuccessful response, so on and so forth, we could write all those. And then just by running, um, running this here, which is 8Base invoke local, the name of the function, and then the name of the request file, we get to run those locally and see what the response is. So for example, our function just deployed. However, we can run it locally here and see what it looks like. Cool, so we see that it actually added to our data object, the trial expiration date, which is 30 days from now, okay? So let's go back to our workspace and actually see this working. So we want to create the first subscription in our database. It, there, it's going to be on the free, right? We're not going to set this because it needs to be done for us. It's going to be for the author, James. It's going to be for the nature publication. And we add that row. Cool. And boom, it went ahead and ran that function before I added the data before we created the record, right? So we covered a lot. Yeah. And I think this is a great spot to stop because if you didn't see anything that's useful for you at this point, I don't think you will going forward. So let's um, stop the screen share. And I'm going to now look at the chat window. And we can start having a discussion. So we actually already have one question, which is really great. Is there a way to copy workspaces one workspace per customer? Maybe I shouldn't have stopped screen sharing because I'm going to open the screen share once again and show you exactly how you can do that. Okay, so we're back in our development environment here, right? And so Chris is saying, hey, how can I copy my workspaces or save my workspaces? Um, the way you can do that, right, is by having the command line tool. And for example, this one's uh, connected to our um, CMS, right? So let's say that the CMS application, you're just building it for a lot of customers. Right. Instead of having to go in every time and set it all up, what we can do is we can say eight base export um, and then pass it a file path or actually let's say export.h so we can see the command. Cool. So here the export options, it needs the file. Okay, so we do it that way. We could pass it a specific workspace ID or the workspace it's currently connected to, it will default for that. So eight base export dash F and we're just gonna put it right in the uh, home of our directory, which is going to be a file called schema, or let's just call it CMS workspace dot JSON. 
All right, and boom. So now we go here, we have our CMS workspace.json and this file essentially has the DSL for our workspace, right? So if I wanted to create a new workspace, I would go ahead and create that new workspace. Um, I would then come to my command line and I would say eight base import. Uh, and I would pass it the path to the schema.json file, I think it's the file schema. Let's see, let's run the help command. Cool. So I'd be able to do the same thing using that JSON file, which would say this is the path to the file with the schema and data and the other options that are in there. Um, and then the workspace ID that I want to pass it to. Right. So using that, you could actually have a single template file that you're using across projects and plugging that into whenever you initialize the workspace. All right. Cool. Chris, was that helpful or relevant? Awesome. Um, anyone else? And then it also too, it doesn't, if anyone has technical questions, it can obviously be a technical question, but if you have any other questions about the company, about plans and pricing, any of that stuff, I'm happy to, uh, happy to address it. Agency model benefits. Thanks, Chris. So um, when it comes to agency, right, what this is how we look at agency, and I think is the important thing to um, to communicate. So eight base has a professional services arm, right? In it, we use eight base. Any project that we do, eight base is the back end for that project, and we have turned down over a dozen projects at this point that have had non eight base requirements, you know, it's saying, Hey, you know, let's say blockchain applications, this, that, the other, why do we do that? Um, one, we love our product, right. And we think it's a great experience whenever you're developing. Um, but two, because it helps us move so fast in our agency efforts that we are realizing profit margins on projects well above 50%, um, which is really hard to do <laughs> if you are just going and building everything from scratch. Right now that we could treat that as our ace in the pocket to where we keep it a big secret and no one else gets to use it. However, we, we believe that eight base can be a very valuable platform company by evangelizing this tool to other agencies. So they get the same benefit. Right. So in the spirit of that, what we've been doing is designing an agency plan for eight base to where, Hey, how can we productize eight base in a way that makes it super valuable for any agency that adopts it as either a core technology or just something in their toolbox when they're attacking um, their client projects. Now, the way that we've designed that to date is we're saying that, okay, for eight base, you get to sign up for a license, right? It's a $250 a month license to start, which gives you access to five developer seats. Um, if you want to add more developer seats for your, your in-house developers, it's $40 a month. However, what's great about that is your, the, um, the workspaces that you create within your organization, any developer in your organization is then able to go and participate in or be granted different types of access to. Whereas right now, you have to just create workspaces on a one-off basis. And, um, and every single time, the workspace itself dictates how many uh, developers can come and work on it. Uh, another thing, right now, uh, if you have an account in 8Base, um, you have one credit card, right? So it's one credit card for all your workspaces. If you're on an agency plan, you can specify a credit card per workspace, right? So, you know, if you have a, a small agency and you have three or four projects on 8Base, maybe that's something that you're very comfortable putting on your personal credit card. That's totally fine. We encourage you to still use the product. Um, however, you know, 
we have some agencies that are doing great that have 10, 15, 20 or more workspaces on eight base. Suddenly, if that's on your personal credit card um, and you have all these customers that you're having to collect an invoice from, it gets a little bit uncomfortable or unmanageable. So by being able to put the eight base subscription on the different cards, you can actually put it on your client's card for them to pay for the resource that they're ended up paying for and not be exposed to that risk yourself. Now, that also gives us the opportunity to offer you a really cool uh, feature, which is only a feature of the agency plan, which is your ability to actually specify uh, service or management premiums that you want us to charge on top of the workspace cost. So what does that mean? Essentially, let's we know that if you're using 8Base, you are working in 8Base and you're providing your customers a service of managing the back end and building the back end. Um, you should be compensated for that. So what we say is, okay, uh, consider the workspace a wholesale cost of what you are getting it for. You know, you are getting this thing that's unconfigured, unset up for, let's say, $175 a month, right? Your client should be then paying you or you can have your client pay $300 a month or $350 a month for all the work that you're doing and managing the project on top of whatever your professional services fees are. Um, and actually through 8 they start to be, build an annuity or a book of, uh, a book of recurring revenue uh, through those service premiums. So suddenly, you know, if you take the workspace cost and double it, and that's what your customer pays, you know, once you have 10 projects on eight, 10 projects on 8Base, you'll have a couple thousand dollars a month coming in um, into perpetuity as long as you're supporting that project on 8Base. And so we think that that's a really valuable way that you can start to use um, eight base strategically in your business to start building recurring revenue um, rather than just always having to chase down one time revenue on customers. Um, I would say that those are some of the, the, the major highlights that um, that we believe is going to be valuable for you. Um, however, if you do not find that valuable, that is 100% something that I and the rest of our team want to hear because we're really trying to figure out what is a way to evangelize 8Base that's going to be productive and useful to agencies. So hopefully that was, um, hopefully that was useful. So anyone has any more questions? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw my email address in the chat right now so that if anyone does have follow-up questions that they either just, it comes to them later or they uh, didn't feel like throwing it in the chat. Thanks, Chris. Um, they can email me. Um, however, I will be on for another two or three minutes, you know, until the hour clips. If someone asks a question, we will go past the hour, but I'm just saying that's the, the time window of waiting right now for a, a follow up. Oh, one second, let me. Panelists and attendees. Cool, my email's in the chat. This will be on YouTube today. And uh, I will send you Let's see, I will send you the link, Chris, once it's up. Maybe I'll cut out the last minute. Glad to hear that. Awesome. Take care.
All right, everyone. Thanks again and signing off.